Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Anargia Vardana. Um, I am a VC at a firm called Maveron. I am based in San Francisco and spend almost all of my time investing and looking for companies in the US. So this is a really unique and exciting opportunity. So I'm excited to be here, happy to be here, and very grateful to the family for inviting me and for, for hosting me here for the uh, last couple days. Fun fact, it is my first time in France. So this, is, this has been really exciting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, I was asked to come in and speak a little bit about frontier tech and what the next frontier of technology looks like. But let me quickly give you my background a little bit on Maveron so you have context. So I've been in Silicon Valley for 11 years now. I started out working at Google in product management, really understanding the core business of Google, which is selling ads and understanding how to provide an amazing experience for people when they get on any of the Google assets. After Google, I went to work at a couple different startups always leading products. I'm a very product, UX, UI focused person. And in, in that time, spent some time working for Ushahidi, which is a nonprofit tech startup based out of Nairobi. So kind of been in many different areas within tech until I came to venture capital about two years ago or, sh or so. And within venture capital, I really fell in love with the ability to partner with founders, to help them push their dreams forward, and most importantly, within consumer technology, to see that technology in the hands of people. So at Maveron, we focus exclusively on consumer technology. So our fund has been around for almost 20 years now, and one of our first investments was in eBay. In eBay, we saw a company taking an existing behavior of buying and selling things and then leveraging technology and building a very strong brand around it so that it became the way to buy and sell things. Uh, so quick survey of the room so I have a sense of who I'm speaking with. How many of you are founders of startups or thinking about starting a company? Cool, a good, good portion of you, awesome. And then how many of you either work in or are building a company that is kind of in the frontier tech space, so really cutting edge technology? Awesome, cool. Well, I hope that uh, this is helpful for all of you, and I think a large part of what I'm continuing to see is that even companies that don't appear to be directly in frontier tech, like they're not a VR startup, still have an ability and opportunity to be connected on some of the most bleeding edge items within technology. So, so we'll dive straight in with that. So, Every period of time has its frontier, and I think we see shifts in how technologies are adopted in different ways and how the platform actually shifts. So if we think a couple years back, we saw a big shift from the internet to mobile. Everyone went from getting on the internet on very slow systems to getting on internet fast and then getting on mobile so that now we all have a computer in our pocket that can do a lot. Before that was that big shift to internet and personal De uh, desktop and PC computers. Before that, we saw regular saw telephones, we saw computers, we saw all these big shifts. And uh, these big shifts come with new consumer behavior within the technologies. They come with new startups, they come with new ideas. And I think it's a really amazing opportunity when these massive shifts happen. And today, we could argue that these shifts are happening as we see more opportunity to use virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these things are beginning to work their ways into our lives and we see another potential shift in how we interact with our technology. So the actual term frontier tech was coined by CB Insights and kind of talking about being on the edge, what's the next, what's the next frontier. And some of the high level things that are included in frontier tech are virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, drones, but we also see other things in there like machine learning, AI, and further subdivisions of that like natural language processing. I, in particular, am excited about a lot of these different spaces. One thing that I see people starting to already use is talking to their devices. Um, how many of you have an Amazon Echo or Google Home or have played around with it? Raise, raise of hands. A couple of you? OK. Um, it's amazing to see, our, and, and many of you have probably played around with your Siri or Cortana or with Google Now, the ability for these systems to understand us deeply, intimately, and to listen to us and help us make decisions is changing at a very rapid pace. I, I quickly see people you, who are on Android where Google Now will tell them, hey, you have to leave now for your meeting, which is 20 minutes from here. And, and that was something that our devices never was able to tell us before. 
And in terms of investment dollars going into this or big outcomes for startups, we're already seeing those things. So some of the things from a couple years ago, we saw a huge acquisition of Oculus by Facebook. We've seen money flow into Magic Leap. Over half a billion dollars has gone into that company, augmented reality company. We're seeing other things like SpaceX privatize space exploration and rocket ship launching and have a lot of money behind that. And even recently, we see companies like Intel acquire automa automated driving systems systems for a couple billion dollars. Like people, big companies, small companies, venture capitalists have an interest in this and it's and it's really pushing forward. And what I spend my time thinking about is frontier tech for the regular consumer. So for regular people, how will they use this? Will they sit in cars that drive themselves? Will they talk to the world around them and say, hey, what's the weather going to be like? What should I eat for dinner? What's the healthiest option at the restaurant I'm going to? The possibilities are really endless. Or maybe they will put on virtual reality goggles and decide where they want to take their next vacation or speak to their family member who lives across the world who they can't interact with on a daily basis. So there's just so many different ways in which we see these entering the consumer's hands, hearts, and minds. And the real question is, how long will it take, and what will that actual experience look like? I think the exciting thing, though, is that consumers are more ready than ever to adopt technology. Everyone is thirsty for technology. There may be an app that you hear about that you're like, wow, I'm going to try it. I'm going to download it, give it a quick try, delete it if I don't like it. That behavior is increasing, whereas even five or 10 years ago, people were reluctant to try new things. They were kind of stuck to their, they had their Gmail, they had their maps, and maybe they had their Facebook, and that was about it. So if we look at what allows us to have this cutting edge of technology right now, there's a couple different things. One thing is that processing power is currently better than ever. Our, our microprocessors are incredibly fast. We can do things on our phones that, were, that we couldn't even do on our regular computers years ago. And the exciting thing is that the phone can be a virtual reality device. You can stick it on front and have a, have a goggle that holds it, and you can experience virtual reality just off of your phone. You can play games on your phone. You can do a lot of really interesting things that weren't possible on this really, really small device. Also, cloud technology allows us to spin up these things in a faster way than ever before. Startups can get started really quickly. They can test. They can learn. And they can iterate and make things better computers in our pocket, like I mentioned. And most importantly, I think, access. People want technology, and they're using technology. Granted, that's on a spectrum. There may be some people who are like hyper, hyper connected. I'm probably in that category, being a VC in Silicon Valley. And there are some people who are kind of middle of the road, using their cell phones for social things, for email, for work, but still integrating it into their days, into their lives. How many of you would say the cell phone is absolutely essential for you to get through your day right now? I would venture a guess, mo yeah, most people, the cell phone is, is absolutely essential to get through the day. It could be for simple things like just making sure, checking in with your kids, your spouse, your parents, your friends, but it could be for more important things like you're, you're moving from one meeting to another and you're on Slack and you need to talk to people. So it has become so ubiquitous, the time is now to be able to develop further applications and further interesting opportunities on it. Um, and if we look at a really interesting graph here, this was exciting to me, um, to take a look at how the speaker market has just changed and how Amazon has taken over it in such a short period of time. When Amazon launched, it was a book company. It was selling books. And then it started selling books online. And then it started selling other things. And for Amazon to, one, have an incredibly huge business on AWS, their cloud services, and then to jump into making an intelligent speaker, the Amazon Echo or the Alexa, is pretty phenomenal. And in just a few short years, it has overtaken some of the biggest companies in that space, Sony, Bose, Jawbone. It's just sped past them and continues to speed past them. Today, a, a large portion of Amazon's purchasing and revenue is coming from people who have that Alexa and are ordering just ba daily basic things that they can do easily through this automated device. And I think we'll continue to see more and more of this. Maybe it's in the space of cars, where automation takes over the traditional big players, or maybe it's in, in something else that we do every day, and there's a giant in the space that a new technology company can, can overrun. 
If we also look at drones, even in the last five, six years, we see an amazing increase in drone purchase. And that's just going up. A lot of the early adopters were filmmakers or people who had a very professional interest in the space. It's starting to become more consumer. People are saying, hey, is there a drone that I can fly for fun? Is there a drone that can follow me when I'm snowboarding down a hill and capture some exciting footage? The, the possibilities are really changing and, and the, the numbers are really showing that. And even in the VR space, there are tons of new companies coming. So in, in the US, I'm seeing tons of startups in the VR space working across a variety of different applications. I would say 70 to 80% of them are in the software space and 20, 30% are building hardware. But in the software space, there are applications kind of across the spectrum. I'll talk a little bit more on the consumer applications. So th seeing things like meditation apps in virtual reality, education apps, ability to learn different things in VR, uh, helping people overcome phobias in virtual reality in a fully immersed environment, and, and lots of games and entertainment-based things. On the enterprise side, seeing abilities for companies to train their employees. Um, I saw a really interesting company where if you're working in a mine and you have to go into this, this machine, this car type thing that you're driving in the mine, you're, you have to be really alert. Your reflexes have to be fast. So you can train in a virtual reality environment, get your reflexes ready, get them fast, and dramatically reduce the cost of training in that little, little car thing. So lots of applications across the spectrum. And I think longer term, people think the consumer application will be augmented reality, where people can walk around and they can see a digital layer on top of their physical world and find it incredibly useful. So even for me today, I was up in the Eiffel Tower and I was looking out and I was wondering, what's that building? What's that area? What's that area? And there's a very nice and easy way to be able to lay augmented reality over that to be able to point out, okay, that's this building, that's this neighborhood, that's this national monument. And already people are thinking about things like this that can enhance the consumer's daily life with, with just the phone, just holding it up and, and seeing what's going on. The VR ecosystem is, is growing tremendously and we're seeing a lot of money flowing in there. So we have companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, all of them are putting money in there. And I think that's not just virtual reality, that's all frontier tech. And what's truly exciting is thinking about how consumers will use it. Um, one thing when thinking about consumers using virt uh, virtual reality or any frontier tech is how does that integrate into their daily lives? Consumers nowadays have expectations around their technology. The technology has to know them intimately. So I'm a vegetarian, and if my technology recommends me a steakhouse, that becomes almost unacceptable. Right now, I can go on Google and I can search for restaurants in Paris, and it'll give me lots of different options. But if you have Google now, it starts to realize what you, what you click on, what you don't click on. It starts being able to see other parts of your Google assets, your email, your, your chatting with friends, many different things to know that, hey, maybe this person is never going to pick a steak. So let's give them the absolute correct recommendation. And for startups thinking about building companies in the space or working in the space, one thing I encourage everybody to think about is what is the behavior that drives people to say, okay, this technology makes sense for me. Maybe it is that the recommendations are better than ever and you reduce the consumer's work by a lot, right? If I, if I don't have to think about what time I have to leave for my meeting, what airlines I'm gonna fly on, what restaurant I'm going to go to, the phone or the computer becomes a personal assistant in the truest sense. And so thinking about it like that and thinking about how people will use it is exciting not only because it'll hopefully guide the company in the right direction, but it's also exciting for me as an investor because it, it then turns not just into you know, a science of numbers and metrics, but also an art of getting under consumer psychology and understanding why people use technology, what emotions connect them to technology, and what drives them to stay with that particular app. In the frontier tech space, as I talk a little bit about investing in that space, um, we've seen a ton of money flow in there uh, in the US and I think uh, already beginning to in the other markets as in Europe and Asian markets. Um, I think one thing that I look at as an investor when I'm vetting a company in that space is do they have the right pairing of technology, so someone who knows how to build it, do they have like a proprietary experience in that? Do they know how to get it right? And is there some secret sauce that they have when they're building it? And then on the other end, 
is, is that person or a co-founder or somebody on the team really getting under consumer behavior? Oftentimes, these two things, the technology and someone who understands consumer behavior, are really, really split apart. And that's tough because you have an amazing piece of technology, but you have no idea how to get people to use it. Why will they use it? If we think about a fun app like Snapchat, it is right now, arguably, I would argue for days, the best augmented reality application out there. You can hold up your Snapchat, you can get a filter on your face, you can move your face, it stays with you. It's, it's astounding, you can get another person in there. That technology is really, really good. But they started out in a really delightful, fun, childish, cute way. And so that was a really good pairing of technology as well as understanding the consumer behavior. People want to take pictures of themselves. They love selfies. And then if you make them into a dog or into something funny, they'll take even more. And so when I look at founders and teams, I'm looking for people who kind of get both sides of that rather than just straight up technology. I also look at timeline. It's going to take a while for consumers to adopt many of these technologies. And in that time, how strong is this team? What can they do? Can they raise enough capital in order to get through that time? What is additional fundraising going to look like for them? Will they begin conversations early on in order to get customers or partners, et cetera, et cetera? So that's a, that's a big thing to look at is, is the timeline. And that brings it down to the founding team, which is who are the people building this technology? Why are they the right people to build it? And how are they going to get through the time frame it, it is required in order to get it into the consumer's hands? The M&A scene, so the mergers and acquisitions scenes for frontier technology is quite strong. Many big companies, we've seen Google, Intel, Microsoft, are excited to acquire these companies, and these companies are, are all over the world. Um, and I think the opportunity there is, sure, these big companies can probably build something, but if they can acquire a team of a few people that have already done it, that have already either gotten users or built something that's really exciting in the tech space, then that's extremely valuable. So we're seeing a lot of that action going on there. And finally, I think what's, what's really promising in the consumer frontier tech space is that these things are being built all over the globe. Um, we're seeing incredibly talented people in the US getting into it, in Europe, in the Asian markets, in, in the African markets, kind of all over the space. Um, and and what, what we really think about is, one, access to technology. And that starts with the cell phone. So, you know, not, not everyone is going to have an Amazon Echo in their house or a Google Home, but many, many people in the world have cell phones, and cell phone penetration continues to increase. And we see ideas where people are able to do chat-based, SMS-based interactions with their users, applications, whether that's purchasing, learning, having a conversation. That's extremely valuable. We're seeing that take off in many, many markets. And adding an intelligent layer to that allows users to have an even better interaction with it, allows them to have recommendations in the chat response that's very, very relevant, connected, and appropriate for their needs. So as we continue to look at this space, I think i leave you with a couple of thoughts. One, Frontier Tech is coming, it's continuing to grow, and it's super powerful. Two, how we think about consumers using them is incredibly important, and we continue to try to understand that. Three, consumers are already using Frontier Tech, and that's promising. They're going to continue to use it even more. And, and finally, I think the, the people to build them, build these applications, are all over. And, and I encourage everyone who is either working at a company, building a startup, to think about how you can make that consumer experience better with these advanced technologies, whether that's data, whether that's an intelligent system, whether that's providing them with a technological experience that was previously unheard of but can happen now because of how far we've come along. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to open it up for questions about anything. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Colin Kramer. Um, thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting, very exciting. Uh, over the last month or so in Paris, there have been a lot of uh, conferences on uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the impact on, on where we're going. What are your thoughts on, on the subject? Yeah, so the question was about artificial intelligence, kind of good, bad. Um, I see a lot of conversation around that because, you know, as you mentioned, there are certain moral questions that come around artificial intelligence. There are privacy questions and concerns. Um, it's a really, really interesting field. And I think that because we're just dipping our feet into what an AI system can do, those are the right questions to ask. 
And I think some examples that we've seen recently is the Amazon Echo was subpoenaed in a murder case because the Echo was recording what was happening in that apartment when someone got killed. And the question was, can you subpoena a piece of technology? Who knows? Is that technology a person? I don't know. So th these were questions that came up during that as well. And I don't have a right answer for you, but I think that one thing that we do need to understand is that as, as these technologies become more intelligent, they become not a human, but similar to a human. And would we subpoena a human who was there watching and looking at all of the things that were happening with this unfortunate incident? Yes. Would we ac ask for video recordings if there was video there? Probably. And so th I think looking at kind of the questions around it and the circumstances around it allow us to think about how to address that. And I think the, the larger question that you're, that you're you know, thinking about and I think everyone is thinking about is, uh, is, there, is there a right or wrong? Is there a way for technology to take over too much of our lives? Does it limit free will? Does it limit spontaneity? You know, if my systems know me so, so, so intimately, am I never going to discover anything new and interesting because it's always giving me recommendations that are 100% tied to my interests and, and what I think I like to do now? I don't know. Um, one thing that I'm grateful for is that people are asking those questions. They're asking the morality questions. They're asking how do we make sure we have really diverse teams where people are thinking about different perspectives. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Um, virtual reality is completely immersive. And sometimes you can almost forget that you're in a fake digitized world. And when you create these experiences, it's really powerful. If you put someone in an experience that for some reason is traumatic for them or is scary for them or causes some kind of emotions to arise for them, that could be extremely harmful. And so thinking about the ethics of that, how do you warn someone and say, hey, this is going to be about X, Y, and Z. It may be traumatic for you. So the right questions, don't know the right answer, but glad that people are asking them. Thank you, Thank you very much. My name is Antonis Giannakopoulos. And mostly what I want to say is not a question, but a statement. Uh, people are talking about artificial intelligence, but real artificial intelligence, uh, it means that we have to reach a singularity point where a machine can actually generate another machine with self-conscience. We are not in this level yet. Uh, probably we have faster computers, we have better applications, we have uh, technology that enhance uh, reality, but we don't have real artificial intelligence yet. Uh, this probably may emerge in 50 or 100 years from now. But now, a computer, the fastest computer we have, is just uh, clever as an amoeba, because it cannot decide itself. And there is a definition It says that something is self-aware when it fears its own death. No machine today fears its own death. Totally, I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, good evening. Thanks for the good talk evening. tonight. Yeah. Um, I have a question related to time to market on frontier, mm -hmm. on these frontier tech uh, startups. How do you analyze that from an investor perspective? Because a lot of the frontier tech is based on technological innovation, which takes a lot of time to, to develop. So how, how do you view as an investor like this time to market and the risk that it involves? Because now we, we, we're really like in the era of uh, you got to get to market quick or like if you're going to die, die fast. Yeah. So I see those projects in a very different ways than the rest of the other tech. And f so from an investor perspective, how do you deal with that, like that time lag? Totally, great question. So, so um, there's two different buckets of founders that we're seeing um, thinking about time to market. So one are companies and founders that want to build something that will drive adoption. So they're, they're going to say, hey, we're going to build something like Snapchat, which gets people used to the idea of augmented reality. Or we're going to build something like Pokemon Go, which gets people used to having picking up their phone and seeing a digital layer on their physical world. So that, that's one bucket. People who will drive the market and create a bigger pool of users. And then there's the other bucket, which is founders who say, hey, we're not going to drive or accelerate the market, but we're going to learn and be there when the market comes. When, they comes, when they come, we're going to be ready and we're going to have the perfect product. Um, so, so we see those kind of that bifurcation of, of founders, which I think both we've invested in both types of founders and both are great. Um, within that, 
when we look at time to market, we want to make sure that one, we're investing in founders who can get through that time because yes, it's gonna be longer. It's gonna be much longer for someone to put on a virtual reality headset and do an application than it is gonna be for them to shop on their phone or whatever. So during that period of time, uh, they probably will need to raise additional capital um, are they able to do that? Do they have a clear vision, a story, uh, connections, you know, that, that, that ability to really raise that capital? Um, two, are they going to learn during that time? So maybe they won't launch the product to a mass set of users, but are they gonna get it out to a small set of users and learn? Because the worst thing, and I've done this in a startup before, is when you're developing in a vacuum and you have no idea if people like it, hate it, kind of like it, and then you wait five, 10 years and you're like, Ah, nobody likes it. Now I'm in really big trouble. So people who have the right learning, experimenting mindset. Um, and, you know, we really want people to understand that in that five to ten years that it may take to get to market, things are going to change a lot. And so people who also have the nimbleness of mind have, have a really smart team who can kind of go with, with the punches. And that's kind of on the, on the bucket of um, people who are probably going to wait and be there when the market comes. For those who want to drive the market, um, that's a really interesting thing because there are big companies in the frontier tech space who are also trying to accelerate the market, Google, Facebook, Apple, all of these folks. And so um, relationships with those companies is really important. You want to make sure that your founder is connected to the head of VR at Oculus who can say, hey, I know that Oculus is working on these things, so we should focus on this other side or, or whatever it is. So those understanding of where the big companies are headed is, is really important there. And then we also want to make sure that if they want to drive the market, how capital intensive is that? Is that giving away free headsets? That sounds expensive. Is it acquiring users for a more expensive way? I don't know, but th that's kind of the high level of where we're looking. Right here. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Stan. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I've got three questions very okay. quickly. So the first one is just to have your view on, uh, they're connected a bit together. To have your view on, uh, on uh, smartwatches in terms of uh, the, the, the feedback on the experience with smartwatches going up and going down. Mm -hmm. Linked to this question is the price point of technology when you enter the market. You said giving away for mm -hmm. free headset is complicated, yeah. but the, the entry, the price point to enter uh, the tech market, hardware especially, is a complicated yeah. question. And the third one is um, as a startup, when you invest into a uh, hardware, basically you spend at one stage a lot of energy uh, developing, not more researching, but developing and industrializing. How do you evaluate the combination as an investor if the, the team still invests in uh, research? Got it. So I think the first question was around wearables and, and, and watches, right? So I have an Apple Watch. I love it. But I think I'm one of the few people who actually uses it as much as, as I think they would want us to. I think the challenge we saw with a lot of wearables and these devices is they got the user to a certain spot. They said, hey, you walked 10,000 steps today or whatever. But the so what? The next step was really missing. So after three months or six months, you're like, great, I walk a lot, but I don't know what, what happens next. Does that make me healthier? Does that make me faster? Whatever. And, and that question was, was left there. So who, take that data and give me the next step. Because you walk 10,000 steps, you should drink a protein smoothie or whatever else it is. Um, and then I think your second question was around heart. Pricing for hardware, okay. So yeah, pricing for hardware is a tough one because you wanna make sure that you're able to set the right price for users to be able to get it, but then you also wanna make sure your margins are good in order to build a good business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think one thing we think about with, with the pricing is allowing for a variability upfront. Um, if you're doing a Kickstarter and maybe selling on Kickstarter for a lower price point to be able to then later sell for a higher price point, that's an option. The trouble with the VR sets right now, end to end, if you want a good VR tethered headset, it's probably $1,000 with the gear, with the right laptop, all of those things. And that's really, really un, you know, a non-starter for, for most consumers. Um, if you're able to 
append or add to an existing hardware. So if you have a phone and you can add a little dongle onto it and deliver at a lower price point, that's pretty valuable. I have a 360 camera called the Insta360. It's awesome. I just plug it into my charging point and I can get a really nice 360 uh, camera and video, uh, photo and video. And I think that was a pretty reasonable price point for people to start adop adopting. The Ricoh Theta is pretty good. Um, and, and then another challenge you put yourself with the price point if it's too high is the, is the channels can be tough. Um, are you selling direct to consumer? Are you going through Amazon? Are you going through many other electronic retailers? And figuring out what is the consumer demographic that comes to these places. Maybe early adopters, gamers and stuff, will buy it for that high price point. But the average middle of the road consumer will, will probably not. So kind of cross comparing to the other things. Um, and then finally, you had asked about, uh, remind me again. Yeah, if, if a hardware company is in the research stage um, versus getting out. So the tough thing about hardware is there's oftentimes delays because people are still getting things right. You get the product out and you find out, okay, the audio doesn't work really well or it's uncomfortable on the consumer's body, face, whatever. And so we acknowledge that it's a constant research process. You're constantly going to be improving and learning. We actually hope that you do constantly learn. Um, you know, if it's still in the R&D stage where it's not ready to be manufactured and sold, I think that's probably more more appropriate for an angel investment or an accelerator that can kind of guide you through those. I think, um, at least in my experience, most of the VCs will want to see that product done, completed in some way and ready to go. Maybe it's going to go back to the, to the shop for more iterations. Um, and then when we think about investing in hardware, there's a couple different things to look at. One, um, what's going to, after someone gets this device, what's next? And that's kind of where a lot of the wearables failed. After they get it, are you going to sell them data? Are you going to give them data? Is that data going to keep them engaged with your product? If so, great. If not, then maybe they take it off their wrist and never use it again. Two, is there some kind of network effect? So I think you know something like a drop cam is interesting because you get one and then you're like, actually, I'm going to get another one and another one. And there becomes this network of these hardware items around your house. And then, the, and then you have the user locked in. They're, they're not going to go get another one because they already have three of these things and it works with their system. And then finally, like, are you, do you have the opportunity to launch additional products? You launch one, is there a second version of it? Is there a kind of a tangential one? So those are the, those are the three buckets we think about in the hardware space to increase growth and have that venture scalability. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I wanted to ask you if it is the right uh, way to establish a, or to start a business uh, based on a specific technology. As you've just mentioned, we have uh, a lot of technologies in the market and it uh, progress rapidly. And uh, once we start developing a, a business uh, based on one specific technology, we have difficulties to catch up and uh, we ended by seeing a product which is uh, duplicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how, what do you think about this? Is it, uh, do you have some recommendation? Yeah, that's, I think that's a tough question, right? So how do you launch something and then hopefully not get outrun and become obsolete? Because Taking I'm, into account the time you yeah, put on it. Yeah, time, money, everything that you put, in to put to develop it. I think that's a big part of what we look in the teams before we invest. Um, do they understand how to keep up with the times, right? And, and we see companies that are repeatedly made more and more obsolete, like regular bookstores started to go out of business because Amazon was starting to sell it online, sell it for cheaper, and go directly to the user. And, uh, and, and there's many examples of this. Regular taxis started to have trouble because Uber and Lyft came in and started you know, doing it in a different way and doing it in an easier way for the consumer. So there's many different industries in which this continues to happen. I think one, yeah, is it the right, can, can you as the team and the founders figure out how to make the right changes? I think that nowadays, it's less likely that you're gonna launch something that is like brick and mortar and, and very, very different from leveraging technology. But it may be the case that you launch something, let's say um, it's, a, it's an app, and then a year from now, nobody is using apps. Everybody is just using SMS. So are you able to think about how to switch it from an app into an SMS-based experience or put it in line or, or WeChat or Messenger or WhatsApp, whatever, then maybe you're able to be nimble and, and work with the times. I think another thing is, 
if you put the cons if, if it's a consumer application, if you put the consumer at the center of the process, not the technology, but the consumer, you're more likely to be able to make the right shifts at the right time. If you're constantly asking yourself, what does Joe or Jill want? Why do they want it? How are they changing? They're not they're no longer going to the store. Okay, then I shouldn't be at the store. I should be online or I should be on their VR headset. So if you put them at the center, I think the changes will happen at, at a faster pace. Hey, um, thanks for giving that presentation. So I've got a question for you regarding the state uh, of play of uh, AR and VR. Uh, to me, uh, I want to understand where are the issues uh, surrounding these technologies? Is it more a problem related to the hardware, which maybe is not mature enough? Uh, or maybe it's just that we don't yet have a killer application that's used by billions of people. Mm -hmm. So I don't have Snapchat personally, and um, I've tried Pokemon Go for, uh, I think, five minutes. That was fun, <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. There, there hasn't been anything sticky. So right. why or what do you think is needed for AR and VR to yeah. make a massive leap forward in terms of uh, you know, user base yeah. and uh, yeah, ubiquitousness. Cool. So quickly, virtual reality is fully immersive, so you cannot see the world around you. You are locked in and you're looking at this digital world. And then AR, augmented reality, is you're seeing the regular world, but you're seeing a digital overlay on top of your regular world. So maybe I would see all of you and then I would see your LinkedIn profiles, which would be kind of cool. Um, so the question is, you know, what needs to happen for that adoption? Um, I'll start with the hardware side. In virtual reality, the hardware is actually really, really good. So the Oculus is good, the Vive is good. It's expensive, so that's blocking a lot of adoption. To get an Oculus or a Vive set up end-to-end -end with the right laptop, it's about 1,000 US dollars, which is like really, really cost prohibitive for most people. So that's a challenge. It's good, but expensive. Um, and then on the augmented reality side, the hardware is not really existent. Um, you can use your phone, which some people do to play Pokemon Go or to do um, Snapchat or whatever, but, but the natural way to use AR is it should be seamless. I shouldn't have to pull out my phone. I should just be walking and seeing like, oh, like there is this cool building and this restaurant has five stars and, and being able to see that, that layer on top. And that doesn't exist yet. And hopefully that'll come with maybe things like Magic Leap or whatever else. So that's kind of answering the hardware question. I think what you said was absolutely right, which is the killer app doesn't exist yet. I am an investor in VR, I have a ton of VR devices, and I still don't have a reason to go into VR every day. Uh, you know, it's, it's not every day where I'm saying, okay, I have to go into VR in order to tend my VR garden, or to learn how to cook this dish, or to talk to my colleague, or whatever it is. And that doesn't exist yet. So as soon as something exists where I have to go in every day or multiple times a day, then you start getting people hooked. And then there's the network effect. So if I say, hey, I can only talk to you in Skype, well, you're going to download Skype, and we're going to talk in Skype. But, but when does VR get there? Well, when the hardware is cheaper and when that Skype or whatever that magical application is exists within it. Um, and then I think, I think finally, um, related to the, to the first question, which is like the, the social and the moral space within it, right? Are people comfortable being fully immersed? Are parents okay with their kids being fully immersed? If a kid plays a game in virtual reality for an hour, do they come out? I mean, research sh shows that kids have a harder time discerning between reality and not reality, and they already do that with, with regular video games. So figuring out what's the user behavior, what's the social acceptance. Um, and I'll, I'll end my question here with a funny story. So I was at Google when we uh, were testing the Google Glass. So it was like just internal, we were testing it. And we would wear it, and we didn't really know what the killer application was. So I would be standing at my desk working, and I would just like take creepy photos of my colleague across from me, because there's nothing else to do. I'd be like, take a photo, take a photo. Um, so when people figure out what's the best thing to do with it, I think that will also uh, increase adoption. Hello, I'm Vincent. Thanks for the inspiring talk. Uh, I would like to come back to the device uh, discussion that we had mm -hmm. um, to discuss a bit about business model around uh, device devices. Uh, we see that Fitbit or GoPro have difficulties to somehow find new business. Or, and I, I was wondering uh, which kind of interesting business model on devices or around services around the device devices that you you have seen in in the valley uh, recently yeah, yeah. Um, great question so Fitbit GoPro uh, as you mentioned um, the what next is a big question and I think that was kind of touching on what I said which is like you have 10,000 steps what do I do next um, some interesting business models 
we're seeing within the hardware space is when there is a strong use for that data. When that data is coming back to the user in a very user-friendly way, and they can they can do something about it. Um, you know, we're seeing companies in uh, the home, the connected home, whether that's a lock, like the August home, which is a lock that you can um, install on your front door, and it has a camera on it. So the lock is digital, and you can, you know, you just use it, and you don't have to use a key ever again. If you have a friend visiting or a family member visiting, you can just give them access. You don't have to say, oh, the key is under the mat or whatever. And then on top of that, they have a camera now. So if you're in, if you're at your house and you hear a the bell ring and you don't know who it's going to be, you can check on the camera. Or if you're traveling and someone comes to deliver you a package, you can see it in the camera and you can say, okay, go ahead and leave the package. Or no, you're, you're a stranger. And so I think that that additional software piece connected with the app that is something really useful for the people um, has, been, has been really valuable. And I think you know, the other thing is when, when someone buys one device once and they don't really need to buy that device again, and there's no connected data to it, that's, that's really the lose-lose. Lose. Um, or if they don't have to buy any, any tangential device for it. So I encourage data or a reason for why they want to buy it again. So I don't know if you've seen Tile, which is a little white square that you can buy. Um, and you can attach it to your car keys or to your uh, remote control. And basically, it, you have an app, and it tells you where these devices are. So if you lose your keys, you can track it. Or if you lose your remote control, which many of us, I think, do for the TV, you can, you can track it. And with that, you buy one or two, and you're like, this is so useful. I want to put one on my favorite sweater that I always lose or on my purse or on my child. So you're able to like, connect it to all these different things in your life, and, and you buy more, more devices. Yes. Yeah, great insights. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm just curious because I work in VC as well, and cool. so I was wondering um, how do you deal with specific frontier tech? Like, uh, do you see any patterns that are repeating, for instance, on the VR, AR, these are kind of new platforms, so do you see um, any, anything useful from the previous mobile waves that you can mm -hmm. apply to understand this new market, or is it so that each time you need to apply some uh, very new specific uh, psychology of consumers to understand it? Yeah. And then second question. Uh, do you see any different uh, categories of frontier tech? Like, for instance, we have the, these new platforms, but also some very new frontier tech, like, for instance, blockchain, mm -hmm. and it's still very difficult to just imagine what the new uh, usages or business models might be. Yeah, uh, great questions, um, and nice to see another fellow VC. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the patterns that we're seeing, I think a lot of the patterns from, from mobile are carrying over. Uh, one of them is, is network effect and social. So in, in VR, in um, chat-based systems, in many of these frontier tech spaces, people want to connect with friends. People want to make new friends. They want to go into a space where they have some kind of social connection. And I think we use that data, which which is engagement to look at a lot of these VR companies. So if a VR company has a social element to it, a network effect, we see through research that the user is more likely to come back and kind of ties to the other question, which is like, what gets me to come back every day? Well, if many of my friends are on there, maybe I will come back and play this game or do this application or, or tend this garden or wh whatever it is. So that the social certainly carries over. Um, the consumer's lack of patience certainly carries over. We have a really, really, really high standard for how good our technology needs to be. If things are slow to download, if they're jittery, if they're weird, if they crash, no patience for that. Consumers aren't going to say, oh, it's OK. I understand it's a new technology. No, they're going to say, I'm not going to use this. This is not any good. And so I think that behavior, because we're, technology is so integrated into our lives, uh, also, also persists in, in frontier technology. Um, and I think this is nice because all the questions are tying together, but, but consumers' questions around privacy, around uh, morality, those also persist, right? People um, were afraid that Uber knew where they lived and they didn't like that. And that's going to continue into frontier technology and people will say, hey, if I'm talking to my Amazon Echo and saying, hey, can you bring me uh, soap to my house? And you're like, wait, now they know where I live and they know that I buy this kind of soap. What else do they know about me? Or they know that I am married and have four kids or, or whatever it is. So I think those things continue to persist. Um, and then I think your second question was around uh, business models for, for this next space. Yeah. These very new cutting edge ones like the blockchain where it's very difficult to imagine what it's going to look like. Yeah, I think um, 
in that, it's hard to know if the existing patterns follow, right? So we say, you know, in, in mobile, um, a lot of it is ad-driven, right? People don't pay to use Facebook, but Facebook makes money off of the ads. People don't pay to use Google, but Google makes money off the ads. Will those patterns persist in frontier technology? That's not, we're not sure. I think people are experimenting with that. In virtual reality, you know, you can add something that is an ad unit pretty easily. Um, you can add a very interesting ad unit. Like if you're in a virtual reality environment, you could have a Mercedes car drive past you and that's way cooler than a static little Mercedes Benz um, sticker ad. So I think those things people are experimenting with, but it's largely unknown because uh, maybe it's way more obnoxious to have a car drive by you than it is just to see a tiny little square. So I think the business model question is still up in the air. And um, especially when there's no users, you don't even know, hey, can I say, like WhatsApp, I'll get to hundreds of millions of billions of users, and it's okay if I don't make money right away because I have so many users, I can even get one cent from all of them and make a lot of money. That's also unknown because we're not sure what the penetration within the user base will look like. I think the answer to your question is easier in the enterprise. So if other businesses are using virtual reality to train their customers or, or, their, or their employees or they're using an um, artificial intelligence uh, system in order to do something for their business, they're more likely to be used to a traditional SaaS model of paying for software. Cool. Well, thanks so much for having me, and I hope you all have a great night.